Sometimes when you're a company, you make a product that you're so proud of that you can't help but name it after yourself, such as the Sega Sega CD or the Ferrari La Ferrari. So how about then today we look at Konami's system Konami. The Konami 573. You've probably never heard of it before. You've also probably never heard of Japan's nice butt day. So let me explain all for you. If you've ever heard, then you've almost certainly played on this system, despite not knowing its name. That sound clip comes from Konami's Dance Dance Revolution series of games, also originally called Dancing Stage in Europe before 2008's DDR-X, with the system 573 running all versions in either analogue or digital format from the first release in 1998 up until 2002's Extreme. Don't worry if you're confused by the analog or digital bit, I'll explain that difference later. The System 573 also ran Konami's Guitar Her I mean Guitar Freaks series of games, and also the Drum Mania series of games, with both now being released as part of the Gitadora series. And so you see, this system ran some of Konami's most well-known Bamani series of rhythm games during the late 90s and early 2000s. It really was only missing the Beat Mania series of games. That said, Beat Mania 2 first style through to about 8 style ran on similar but completely different hardware. Let's add that to our list to talk about later. The 573 had this rather distinct design, with this blue and black colouring scheme. Except this case style was not that common really, at least with Bamani games. Instead, these opted for a more dull and shiny galvanised steel case instead. It seems to me that this case style was only used with a few of Konami's games, such as Dark Horse Legend and the Fisherman's Bait series of games, the latter of which being the game that this system used to run. The 573 is a very versatile system, being designed with a built-in jammer connector and having JVS connectors on the right hand side as well as two extended I.O. ports above them. Whilst looking like DE9 serial ports, one is actually for connecting player 1 and player 2 kick harnesses to, whilst the other is connected to a quad channel analog to digital converter for potential use on games like drivers. Audio comes in the form of either line level RCA jacks, an amplified stereo speaker output, and also mono audio from the jammer port, or rather amplified left channel, and whilst this looks like USB, it's not. This is called a JVS I.O. port and it's completely different to USB, using RS-485 for a multi-drop I.O. bus with auto ID assignment. I won't go into the full details of the JVS standard in this video, but it replaced jammer in arcade cabinets allowing for more flexibility in controller input and output. The 573 uses 5.25 inch CD drive for reading its game media. These are the same as PC readers, so standard Atapi drives. Rather specific Atapi drives. Yep, you guessed it, I'll explain that later. Due to Konami using standard PC style Atapi CD drives, there wasn't many options for them to implement other security features into the discs, such as an identifying feature that can only be made at manufacture by a disc pressing machine. So Konami opted to use these security cards instead, which would plug into the board here. These cards can also serve as dual purpose as they can carry extra hardware to add numerous features to the 573. In the Guitar Door series, for example, it would allow Guitar Freaks and Drum Mania to link up by using a serial cable connected to these cards, with the other end connecting to what was called a multi-session unit, so that players could play together in jam sessions. In fact, the security card has an 8-bit input port, 8-bit output port, bit banged I2C and SBI ports, and even a UART or serial port. However, these cards did not curtail piracy. In fact, towards the end of the 573's life, bootleg software was so rampant to the point that if you saw a DDR Extreme in the wild, then there's a high chance that it's in fact running a bootleg version. Betson Imperial, an authorised Konami distributor in the US, would also use these bootleg discs when quote, repairing, end quote, 573's that were sent in for servicing. There's also a subtle irony in the fact that bootleggers would also use their own protection schemes to prevent their hacks from being copied and sold on. 
These would often come in the form of a BIOS upgrade, consisting of a mod board and a modified BIOS to pass certain strings of information to the game, which were read to check the mod board was actually present and so validate the bootleg disk. On the right side of the system is where you'll find the dual PCMCIA slots, although I'd hesitate to call them PCMCIA compliant. Another quirk of 573 that is uh, perhaps worth talking about later. Typically, these slots were used for PCMCIA flashcards. Cards with up to 32 megabytes of flash ROM for storing either game data or user files on. They were also used to connect the 573 to a network unit likely running Toshiba's Udios real-time OS. The network unit would allow games to connect to an early version of Konami's e-amusement network service and allow for downloadable content to be saved to the 2.5 inch hard drive. Around the back is a removable panel which in this case has an extra I.O. connector for the reel. This is where the reel for Fisherman's Bait would connect into. It connects to an internal I.O. expansion board, which we can see when we open the lid. Here is the real expansion I.O. board. Whilst this unit had this real expansion, most of the Bamani series of games would use two different I.O. boards. One of those is called an analog I.O. board. It's essentially a collection of 74 LS273 latches for up to 30 extra output channels and was also the same I.O. board that was used in Fighting Mania. Perhaps ironically named then as it has no audio processing ability, although it's called this as games using this board would use the audio output port of the CD drive and possibly to differentiate it from the other type of audio board that was used. This is the digital I.O. board, but now contains an FPGA device acting as a decryption device which feeds decrypted MP3 audio into an MP3 decoder, the output of which is then fed into the same audio input on the 573 motherboard where the CD drive would typically connect to. It also has a pair of RCA jacks at the back for networking to other units using an asynchronous serial connection in a ring topology. This was used by the DDR Solo spin-off series to enable linking up to four machines together where players would compete each round for the highest score. The digital board also helped to introduce a less than nice feature. Each digital I.O. board was built with a DS2401 digital ID chip, which made each 573 unique with a 64-bit serial number. Whilst it might have been added for the aforementioned networking, Konami also used it to marry each security card to the game board, at least in the case of Bomani games. This meant that even if you bought a legitimate CD and cartridge that had been used prior, the software would just refuse to work on a different unit. And it doesn't seem to be an anti-piracy feature either, just forcing operators to buy new mixes from Konami's distributors instead. Hmm, I wonder why the bootleg disc became so popular. With the I.O. board removed, however, now we can take a full look at the main system board. The architecture might look complicated, but perhaps those Sony chips might give you a clue as to what it really is. Or how about we compare it to what's within the Sony PlayStation, in a fetching black colour. You can see it has the same CPU, GPU and SPU chips. And if you overlay all the chips, you can see how this top corner of the 573 is essentially an onboard PlayStation 1. The only difference is it has twice as much work and GPU RAM, and a lack of a CD drive controller. Other additions to the 573 are H8364 microcontroller for handling the JVS serial bus, a Konami Custom A6 for handling the JAMA port and other inputs, a CPLD acting as an address selection switch for the various additions, the aforementioned dual PCMCIA slots, 16 meg of flash ROM, a security card slot, and also an RTC timekeeper chip. These were common in Konami arcade boards during the late 90s and early 2000s, sometimes acting as just an RTC in saving operator settings, bookkeeping and high scores, to acting as part of the security system for the game in their later boards. It's soldered into the board, not socketed like the BIOS RAM, so if it's dead, it will need to be desoldered first. So where does all this extra stuff actually connect to? Well, it electrically is using the same signals that you typically find on a PlayStation's parallel port. So aside from extra RAM, everything that makes the system 573 can essentially be considered a parallel port device for the PS1. Pretty fascinating stuff. <laughs> 
And to preempt the question, no, you cannot play PlayStation games on the Fire Stand 3, or vice versa without extensive modifications. Already you might be seeing just how affordable and expendable this system really was. Whilst I have no idea of what Konami's intentions strictly were with the 573, from the outside it really does seem like a Swiss army knife of an arcade board. The Jammer and JVS ports allow it to be used in the existing cabinets that are used either standard, covering both old and new design, and being based on the very popular PlayStation 1 made it very easy to develop games for and use the same tool sets that developers were already familiar with, so it added little extra development cost. The use of CDs and security cards also made it very cheap to distribute games for, as the security cards only needed to contain a simple secure ID device inside of it, and if you really needed to expand the base hardware, it was very easy to do, via either the PCMCIA expansion port, or the internal I.O. expansion, which was effectively the System 573's version of this PlayStation Parallel port. And yet, to the best of my knowledge, only Konami ended up using it, and towards the end of the system's lifespan, it served as mostly the basis of the Bomani series of games. That said, it's not entirely unsurprising, as it's around about this time that arcade games shifted to a new kind of playstyle, and that was offering an experience that you couldn't necessarily get at home. Stick-based games, especially in Western countries, were becoming increasingly unpopular against games like Drivers, Light Gun Games, or even games that offered a unique playstyle like Beat Mania or DDR. And also, the PlayStation was gradually looking more archaic in terms of graphic output as each year went by. The 573 is based entirely on the last generation of technology and would be entirely surpassed by the PlayStation 2 at the turn of the century, with Sony teaming up with partners like Namco to make systems like the Namco System 246, the 573 equivalent of the PS2. Even the Sega Samu Atomis wave would make it cheaper to make and produce Dreamcast-like games for the arcade. And so, whilst this is entirely speculation and just of my opinion as to why, I think ultimately it was just outdated within a year after release, and thus just not as popular, especially once the Naomi and System 246 were in use. And whilst games like Fighting Mania and Bishibasu proved that you didn't need great graphics for good gameplay, releasing a driving game or shooter for the system would just look worse compared to the games beside it, which might have included Daytona 2 or House of the Dead 2. So its use within Bomani games is more of a case of the hardware already being in place and where graphical fidelity wasn't really that important as much as input timing and sound design were, any on-screen graphics being more for visuals than gameplay anyway as most games would typically use scrolling charts to play instead, for the most part anyway. Beatmania 2 DX also used PlayStation hardware, called the Twinkle system. And whilst on the surface it looks like the 573 could have been used, I don't think it was partly because the game required a lot of extra hardware. Firstly, it needed an extra graphics board just to allow the overlay of gameplay on top of live video from either video CD or DVDs, and the 573 expansion connector just didn't have any video signals going into it. Secondly, it also used a second audio board to play the music for the game with DSP sound effects overlaid on top and mixed in with the game audio, and though the 573 did get a digital audio board, it didn't have any DSP functions and was released a year after the first version of Beatmania 2DX. And whilst not a restriction of the 573, the original Twinkle system used various discs and hard drives for its games, typically consisting of a game program CD, a hard drive for the audio files, and then usually a video CD or DVD to store the background video. All in all, it was a game that, uncompromised, the 573 just wasn't designed to handle. Otherwise, the hardware was good enough and it was already in place for most of the cabinets that were designed to play the games, thus making it cheaper and easier to push updates to them. But ultimately, the system was eventually phased out, with Guitar Freak's 11th mix and Drum Mania 10th mix being the last games released for the system in 2004. Initially, it was replaced by the System 246 like Konami Python, which was a short-lived arcade system before itself being replaced by the Konami Python 2, an only slightly longer-lived system before Konami shifted to PC-based arcade systems around 2008, a method which is still in common use by all manufacturers today. So what the heck is Nice Butt Day? Well, it's the same reason for the 573's name, something in Japan called Goro Awaze, 
To explain it, I'll first need to clarify that I'm not a native Japanese speaker, so I apologise if I make any mistakes during this explanation. In English, all of our numbers from 1 to 10 are distinct and never changing. They're always pronounced 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And whilst in Japan these numbers are all written the same, in kanji at least, the pronunciations might differ depending on the context of the sentence. So there can be multiple ways to read the same kanji character for numbers. For example, the number 8 could be read as hachi, ba, pa, or ya. And as the Japanese language is based on phonemes, when read as individual numbers, they can in fact read as other words or sentences. For example, 23 or 23 can be read as ni and san. And so 23 is often the number the car manufacturer Nissan will use in their advertising. And so 573 can be read as ko, na, and mi. So the system name can be quite literally read as a Konami system, Konami. Oh, and 1104 or Iyoshi can be translated as nice butt. Therefore, November the 4th is nice butt day. And now you know. Earlier, I said that the system 573 cannot play PlayStation games. Well, it has most of the hardware of the PlayStation, but lacks the correct PS1 BIOS, CD drive controller, and has an additional watchdog timer, all of which mean that software will never run on a stock machine. The watchdog timer, a Konami 058232 in this machine, is designed to reset the system if the software hangs in an attempt to keep the machine always operational. This chip needs to have its input cycled at least once every 350 milliseconds or it will reboot the system. Whilst the Konami 573 BIOS and all software will do this, no PlayStation game is programmed to do this. So at best, you may get one and a half seconds of the Sony copyright warning before the 573 is rebooted. However, that's if it can even load that far. Without the stock CD drive controller, a game will only work for as long as it's using data that's stored in RAM. And it will either hang or crash when it tries to read from the PS1 CD drive, which on the 573 is completely absent. But that's assuming that the game will even load. Most games will never load as they use a system.cnf file, a file which allows a game.exe to be relocated elsewhere on the disk. But this file is completely ignored by the 573 BIOS as it will only execute a psx.exe file on the root of the CD. And though, even if you got it running, you might not be able to control the games anyway as no game was programmed to look at a parallel port for input. All games read from the front controller ports, of which on the 573 there are none. Well, sort of. It turns out that the PS1 controller and memory card ports are in fact wired to this small expansion header, and using a suitable adapter, you could add PS1 controller support back to the 573. And yes, that is a hacked up SATA cable. They don't make TX connectors anymore. Also, no, the PS1 BIOS will not work the 573. The PS1 BIOS shell will try to check for the presence of a CD in the PS1 CD drive, which again it can because there is none, and so instead it just unceremoniously crashes. That said, it is technically possible to run the 573 BIOS on a PS1, provided you have an IDE port wired to the PS1's parallel port and you upgraded the RAM. You could in theory load 573 software onto the PS1. However, the BIOS would fail when it detects the missing HAMCU or even the flash ROM chips. And so there you go, a definitive reason to why the system 573 cannot play PS1 games at all. Well, of course, if you modified the game to add the watchdog support, IDE support, and input system support, then it can. This port of wipeout to the 573 patches the execution code to read from the jammer inputs, and also patches the file loading code to load from a hard drive set as the secondary drive. But wait, why didn't you just load files from a CD drive? Why use a hard drive? Well, there's two reasons for this. Firstly, the 573 BIOS is not booting this EXE directly. It was uploaded by using a modified version of Lightload. Lightload is loaded onto the 573 using the CD drive so it can download programs into RAM via the serial port. So Lightload needs to be inserted into the drive firstly. But burn the EXE to the CD then? 
And that's the second reason. Let's talk about a tappy. Here is the 573. And here is every optical drive that I currently own. And here are the drives that work with the 573. And of those, here are the drives that work with the analog versions of DDR. Why so few? Well, the System 573 may have a built-in IDE port, but it's connected in a very basic way. The IDE or ATA specifications define multiple modes of operation that a device and host can work at. Usually in computers, the bus runs in DMA or Ultra Arsa mode. However, on the 573, it only runs in Program DIO mode or PO mode. Essentially, this means that all transfers are handled by the CPU writing commands to the drive and then reading the data back manually. Whilst this makes adding to port to the PlayStation bus very easy, this makes transfer speeds very slow. It also means that all software needs an embedded Atapi driver in order to read from the drive, and herein lays a problem. The driver embedded in the BIOS shell is not widely compatible with a lot of drives, and as such, a lot of them will just not work with the 573's stock BIOS. And in games like the analog versions of DDR, they have even less forgiving drivers, which further limits the drives. But a tappy drive should just follow the spec, right? Right? You'd think that. But like dialects and languages, there's always nuances. And those nuances in how the drives talk to the host is what causes this incompatibility. And whilst I've not found anything to confirm it, I have been told that apparently most drives were designed to work with Windows computers first, not necessarily to follow the Atapi spec to the letter. This is also why some ODEs will work right out of the box since the developer likely followed the Atapi spec much closer than regular drives did. So in short, writing for a driver that works with all Atapi drives is actually not that trivial, and hence why the 573 BIOS can read drives that even DDR's second mix can't. Despite this, however, in theory, if software supported it, you could use other devices like IDE hard drives, SSDs, or compact flash adapters in addition to, or even with the correct BIOS, in place of the CD drive. But then why couldn't you use PCMCIA slots for the CF card? I've seen those adapters that let you do that. It's true that there are compact flash to PCMCIA adapters, and even Konami use these in later systems like the Viper. And what's more, the Revision B version of the 573 BIOS shell even has an icon that suggests it was originally going to be able to boot from a CF card that was plugged into the PCMCIA slot. Whilst it seems like it should work, they don't. And seemingly, they can't. The PCMCIA slots on the 573 were wired as memory devices with a single chip select pin, and as compact flashcards often run in IDE or ATA mode, they need at least two chip select pins. And in both slots on the 573, they have these chip select lines tied together, making their use with these passive adapters impossible without modification. This section of the schematic shows that the CE pins on slot 0, or the top one, could be separated with one going to the CPLD and the other going to a bank selector. But as you can see, the two lines are joined together and they're also like this on the PCB. Perhaps this is why the version B BIOS doesn't actually try to boot from CF cards. Well, now that you and I are fully acquainted with the 573, let's finally plug it in and play again. Oh, for f Did you know that this video contains almost a year's worth of research in it? Well, with the help from SMF and Spicy JPEG, now all of that research has not only gone into making open source schematics for the 573, but also a fully open source software development kit. You can find a link to the repository containing the KiCad project in the description of this video. And if you fancy porting or developing bespoke 573 software, a link to the PSN Noob SDK will also be in the description. Special thanks to all the people that have helped to make this video, whose names that you can see scrolling along the bottom of the screen right now. If you like this video and want to support me, subscribe and like this video, and if you have any questions, leave a comment.